Hello, everyone. My name is Justin Sterk. Um, as Josh said, I'm the Staff Council Compliance Manager at U.S. Sailing. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Safe Sport as soon as we get these slides up. Um, but I guess in the meantime, I'd like to introduce my uh, fellow panelists here. I'll let you guys introduce yourself. Say where you're at now, what your work with U.S. Sailing has been, maybe. Hi, everyone. My name is Tara Foster. I'm currently the sailing director at Eastern Yacht Club in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Um, my work with U.S. Sailing, I am a level one instructor trainer and a level three certified coach. Um, and I do a variety of other things as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Broom. I'm down at American Yacht Club. I'm also an instructor trainer for a couple of the small boat stuff and power boating as well. All right, we're just getting this set up here. I don't think, is it good? Perfect. All right, so like I said, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Safe Sport background um, first, just to make sure everyone's aware of the, the how, why, what. Um, I think that's always a good practice um, when I'm doing these, when I'm doing these uh, talks. And then at the, you know, at the end, we'll sort of talk a little bit about how Safe Sport and Safe Sport related policies um, can be and have been implemented at uh, the local sailing organization level. So um, I'll try to get through this here relatively quick so we can get to some questions. Um, so I think it's important to uh, point out that Safe Sport uh, as a concept has been around for about 10 years. It was originally started by the USOC, um, now the USOPC. Um, as it's, in my understanding, first initiative to combat um, abuse uh, within the Olympic sport movement, uh, whether it be sexual abuse, physical abuse, hazing, harassment, st anything. Um, it was more of an internal policy within the USOC, uh, definitely not as sophisticated and widespread as what it's now turned into. Um, moving along, um, I think the catalyst um, that created what we now know as the U.S. Center for Safe Sport was the um, horrific <clears throat> incidents that happened at USA Gymnastics. Uh, there's been others, but gymnastics was probably the biggest one um, involving the team doctor um, that led to uh, a lot of lobbying in Congress and activity in Congress. And what came out of that was a new federal law called the Safe Sport Authorization Act. Um, uh, it was implemented in late 2017. And one of the main things I did was create uh, an independent organization called the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. Uh, they're located in Denver, Colorado, and they have uh, independent. They're an independent organization with the authority to oversee uh, all of the national governing bodies uh, in the Olympic movement when it comes to abuse and misconduct. Uh, the intent there was the lessons learned from incidents like what happened at gymnastics was that the the institutions, the national governing bodies, were not in a position to uh, self-regulate, self-investigate um, uh, reports and complaints. Uh, so now we have uh, an independent uh, body that oversees all of that. They um, operate pursuant to what's called the Safe Sport Code, uh, which is basically their, their bylaws um, and the rules by which they, they operate. No? There we go. All right. Sorry. Um, just a side note. Um, well, I guess I'll move on to the... So I guess the big question is, what does the center do? Also, I might use the word the center. Um, that's the same as the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. They're big into branding. That's what they prefer to be called. Um, so I guess you can kind of, you know, with regards to what the center actually does, it's sort of, I, I like to separate it into three buckets. Uh, two of them are sort of front-end abuse uh, and misconduct prevention um, policy and training, and then there's the back-end response and resolution. So on the front end, there's the Safe Sport training course, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, raise your hand if you've never, if you don't know what Safe Sport is or have never heard of the center. <laughs> nice ones, too. All right. Uh, so there's the, the training curriculum, which everyone's aware of. Um, it involves uh, 
training on abuse and misconduct, recognizing red flags, how to report, when to report, um, known or suspected incidents. Um, it's about 90 minutes long. It operates um, on a four-year cycle, which I'll get into in a little bit. Uh, there's also the abuse and uh, prevention policy development, um, which in addition to the training are policies that are meant to um, cut down on or completely prevent unobservable and uninterruptible one-on-one -on -one contact uh, between minor athletes and adults. And then on the back end, I think what the center was initially um, really uh, set up to do was the response and resolution. So once a report is made, it's, it's the response, um, the investigation side, and then um, the, I'm not sure what that was. The, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, the potential sanctions against individuals who are found to be you know, responsible for different violations. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to hit on, and I promise it, 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 it illustrates what the center does, is they also, we, we are directly responsible to them when it comes to running our own events and operating U.S. sailing. Um, so we just went through our first uh, on-site audit this, this year. Um, so they were on-site at two of our events. The first one um, was a, actually just a site visit where they are um, there to advise and make sure that we're being you're prepared for our actual audit. So the, the site visit was actually at the Chubb Junior Champs in Marblehead, and um, that was a great opportunity. Uh, our own Henry Brower was kind enough to lend his 40-foot powerboat for the day for um, the compliance person from the center that was there and their CEO. So we made a very good impression. Uh, and I think it set up sort of a an unfair precedent because I, the word got out, I'm, her, I'm told, that the center, that the sailing events are the ones to go to for their auditors. <laughs> um, and we had a really nice day, calm conditions. So fast forward about a month to the actual audit, which was um, down in North Carolina at Camp Seagull. Um, Conditions were, I don't know if that, maybe you guys have heard, it was pretty gnarly there. Um, and we did not have a 40-foot boat at our disposal, so we took the auditor out on, uh, must have been maybe a 15-foot just, just coach boat. And everyone got soaking wet, and, and the auditor was not prepared for the conditions, for sure. He had to change his clothes at the end, so. Um, but that's just sort of, like, they are very uh, in tune with what U.S. Sailing is doing, how we run our events. Um, and... Uh, fortunately, I think we did pretty well at the audit, and we'll be hearing more about that in the next month or two. Um, so just to get back to the training, you guys are uh, pr probably familiar with it. I kind of hit on it a little bit. Um, I think the one thing I do want to point out is that uh, it, it, it's a four-year curriculum, so this is what people are maybe a little less familiar with. So there's the main uh, core training course that you all are aware of that takes about an hour and a half, and then there's three refresher courses that are meant to be taken yearly, you know, on the, the date um, uh, yearly, and those make up the four years of the training, uh, and then it starts over with the main course again. Um, they also offer a number of other courses uh, that are not the actual uh, core safe sport trained course, including health uh, courses for health professionals, parents, high school athletes, um, and adult athletes. Um, and I think the big thing is these are all free for U.S. Sailing members and uh, our organizational members. So it's something that we really encourage you to take advantage of. Contact me um, if you're interested in getting your uh, staff, volunteers uh, trained. We can set that up. All the directions are on our website, too, so feel free to go there. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Um, and then with the training, I just wanted to kick it to our panelists a little bit um, to maybe weigh in a little on a little bit on how they decide who takes training. Maybe the people that they would recommend to have the training at their at their um, organizations. Um, so, Tara, Kevin, can you um, maybe weigh in a little bit who about you know who at your organization takes the training, what you're looking for um, as far as volunteers as well. Uh, that might need to take it, or that you would want to take it. Okay. So one of the big things we've implemented is uh, 
not only do, of course, all of our instructors, junior instructors, and volunteers that help out with our youth program, so especially if they're on our uh, youth sailing committee, they all need to be safe sport trained because they have authority over the minors that are in our program. But we are a yacht club, so a majority of our sailing uh, is actually a little more adult focused. Um, and so, Am I going out to all 800 some odd members and saying, oh, well, you're at the Yacht Club? No, uh, I am identifying those key adults who have regular contact and authority over the minors that are in our program. So whether that's the staff that's having direct impact on the day-to-day -day for those minors, or whether it's um, you know key flag officers who have you know say over how our program operates, uh, council members, um, and most especially uh, members that regularly volunteer to help out with our youth programs and events. Um, most of them have to go through the safe sport training, especially if they're a race officer or a judge, so they're helping with any of our regattas. Um, but even the ones who are regular volunteers in a way where perhaps are the ones who oversee the lunch hour or they oversee um, getting everyone set up and organized and where the boats need to be, right? They're directing where the kids need to go on a regular basis for especially if a multi-day event happens. Um, the goal and idea being we wouldn't want them to you know, direct a kid somewhere the kid doesn't need to be. Um, and also to have the training to understand what they need to be keeping an eye out for. Uh, when we have, especially for example, Junior Race Week, we have what, it's like 200 kids that come into the harbor. Um, what they need to be looking for when they're keeping an eye on the kids in the parking lot and making sure that everyone's staying safe. Um, so it's just kind of a matter of balancing who has that regular and uh, sustained contact um, with the kids and has that authority to be able to direct them where the kids would be like, oh yeah, this is someone who's supposed to be telling me where I'm going and what's happening. Um, so there's that kind of innate trust then of this is an adult that I need to be listening to. Very similarly, we started with our coaches, instructors, volunteers that are focused around the juniors and have expanded beyond that. We're a club that also has different activities on shore. So we have swimming and tennis and a few others. So we have to sort of monitor, make sure anyone who is connected with any of the junior sailing programs do take safe sport. But in addition, we have a, a wider network that we sort of lean on. And then beyond that, we have about 140 people on our race committee group. So not every person on the race committee, like a mark boat or something, is going to be required to have safe sport. We encourage them and we try to have as many people be aware of the training as possible. But it's the decision makers, it's the people that have um, more, again, what Tara said, the sustained and uh, regular contact with the juniors, whether it's registration desks or, or uh, PROs or anyone who actually has overlap with the, the kids more than just on a Friday night sunset series. Uh, in addition to that, we ask our volunteers to be aware of it, but then a lot of the senior staff at the club also get safe sport trained as well. Awesome, thank you. So just I want to touch on a little bit of the, the other side of the, the policy development. Um, so there are also um, uh, abuse prevention policies that are focused on uh, eliminating um, or cutting down on the time that... Um, adults might have un unobservable and uninterruptible contact with minors. So and that, that can take uh, various forms. Um, the big ones that uh, the center has put out to us are uh, just team meetings, making sure that there's, you know, there's, there's not one-on-one -on -one closed door meetings with athletes, with minor athletes. Uh, when you're communicating with your team, trying, trying to, you know, make sure that there are two coaches on an email or two coaches on a text chain to the team or another parent, something like that. Those are all just best practices that, um, I think as we move down this road more, it will just become uh, common sense. Um, and again, that's uh, based on the centers. You know, the expertise that they bring shows that, um, you know, when there are problems, uh, a lot of times they evolve, you know, from these, you know, personal relationships between adults and minors that aren't um, out in the open. So doing everything you can to, you know, take away those, those you know, as a, in a systemic way, taking away those opportunities. Uh, is important. And then just the last thing I'll touch on before we turn it back over and talk a little bit more about, you know, how things work on the ground. Just want to hit on the response and resolution. 
um, work that the center does. So they're responsible for you know you know taking in reports. So every, you know now that you've taken the safe sport training, you know to to call this you know U.S. Center for Safe Sport if you um, are made aware of an issue that um, involves sexual, physical abuse, hazing, bullying, stuff like that. Um, they'll make a ju jurisdictional determination uh, when that report comes in and either take jurisdiction or turn it back over to U.S. Sailing um, or you know, maybe the local sailing organization. Um, if they do take jurisdiction, they have full jurisdiction. They No one else is uh, permitted to be involved in that. So, um, And that's by design, again, to, to ensure that um, if it's something that's within their purview, these are the. This is the organization that's independent, that is um, staffed by capable, uh, trained professionals that can handle that. Um, and then, if it's determined that you know, through the investigation that a um, individual violated a safe sport policy, they can um, impose uh, sanctions um, up to and including suspensions from organized um, sailing in this case, and uh, there's also the option for arbitration. So if um, an individual is uh, given a sanction, he or she can opt to have an uh, independent arbitrator look at that. So that is sort of a quick overview of the response and resolution um, process. And I think all this is just sort of to highlight um, that I believe that there, especially in the last five to 10 years, is a, there's a very, um, strong shift in what society, society expects of institutions, including sport organizations. Um, maybe what didn't seem like necessary policy even five, 10 years ago, I think is going to become more mainstream. Um, and it's important to remember that the center is here to support um, not only US sailing, but all of our uh, organizational members in educating themselves, educating their members um, on you know, the best practices for uh, how to run your program from an abuse and misconduct standpoint, especially as it relates to mind to youth sailing. Um, and, you know, at U.S. Sailing, we, we want to support that. We want to bring you all in your organizations with us um, on this journey. And we think the Safe Sport Framework um, in general is a great model for all sport organizations uh, to, to work under. Um, and... With that, I think um, we can talk a little bit more um, about what goes on at, the, at your local level. I think a good um, shift uh, to transition would be to, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the safe sport policies themselves. Is there, um, are, are there policies in place at your organization that maybe even preceded or predated safe sport that um, would have worked to establish boundaries, you know, appropriate boundaries between adults and minors? Thank you. I think I will admit most of the things we do at a, uh, where I work, I've straight up stolen from U.S. Sailing. So there's a whole part of level one and the uh, how to be an instructor. And then I think it's now 20 minutes. I'm not sure on the online version, but it talks about uh, coaches and instructors working with sailors in certain situations and how to deal with parents and how to manage up and down and all that. So a lot of the things like not being alone with a minor or being in an office by yourself or open versus closed door or even just talking to parents. We definitely do the safety in numbers. So we try not to have any of our staff or volunteers be on a one-on-one -on -one situation ever. Uh, it's usually at least um, a, a group decision or at least a group conversation. And then other things trying to, it's been interesting watching some of the social media platforms evolve where it used to be kids only and then all of a sudden it's just parents only um so we do have certain rules about how to to what how to i guess how to represent yourself and the program you're in and then other peers and friends or people you're just even sailing by so a lot of those things we've borrowed that i think uh has been echoed and it uh, shared in a different way through the safe sport training yeah. i would second that i i um I think most of the uh, initiatives and kind of rules we've put in place and guidelines for the programs that I've worked with have uh, largely come from the training that U.S. Sailing had previously rolled out. But I think what really happened with uh, Safe Sports um, framework was that it reinforced certain areas and added a deeper understanding on why those guidelines were necessary and what they did to really help 
um, not only protect the kids, but also to protect our instructors and our uh, staff um, and our members, uh, which I think is a really key part of it. It deepened their understanding of um, why those sorts of things were necessary. So that was a really great part of it uh, that I think uh, is a benefit to uh, our local organizations, um, kind of reframing the discussion less of a, oh, well, you have to do these things because you're being told to, and more of a, you should really do these things because it's not only helping, you know, the communities we're trying, or, you know, the new generations that we're trying to help uh, and teach, but it's also helping you and protecting you. Great, thank you. Um, sort of similar, similar vein. Um, if you're an organization that is interested in learning more about um, implementing the safe sport policies or maybe how to do it. Um, what are your suggestions for how to go about doing that at a yacht club or at a community sailing, local sailing organization? Um, who do you think needs to be the ones pushing that? Who needs to buy in? Um, who, you know, is it something that like a board would need to implement? Yeah, I think uh, it's really important for it to be bought into, uh, especially from the upper level of an organization. Um, but also, I, I think it's really key for parents to be made aware of it, uh, for there to be support within the people who are going to be, you know, benefiting from these policies in the way of, perhaps benefiting is not the right word, but they're going to be the ones who are going to be uh, most served by these framework sort of policies. Um, so. A big thing that I did previously before working with the Eastern, um, I worked with a community boating organization in Florida. Uh, we rolled out all of the parent pamphlets to our parents, and we made sure that those were available on our website. And once they started learning more about why we were changing policies and guidelines and why pickup time had to be at a certain time because two instructors had to be there and be available, um, it was great for them to see why those things were changing and shifting and why it wasn't a, oh, I can just call Tara and she'll just wait an extra 30 minutes with my kid <laughs> you know what I mean so it, it made a big impact on how they interacted with us and how we were able to interact with them and provided a larger framework for what our program was doing moving forward awesome I think we came down at a lot of places where we're involved have people that are involved with risk management it could be council or board members and things like that so that definitely fell to people who they specialize in that for us. And then we also came at it from the education side because this, besides having all these rules and things that you have to do or should already be doing, there's also a lot of resources that I personally learned a few things about uh, that I think just make us better teachers and educators. Awesome, thanks for that, guys. Um, have you come across any challenges implementing some of these policies, maybe even if it's not safe sport per se, but I know Tara, you just mentioned, you know, the pickup time, stuff like that. Like, you know, you know, first of all, conveying maybe some of these policy, policy changes, uh, changes, and then um, being able to articulate why you're doing it. Are there, have there been challenges that you've seen with parents or volunteers or the club leadership, um, you know, with it, these changes that may have been made in the recent years? I think one of the biggest ones is the con the concern I get back usually about safe sport policies is for the member who once a year decides, wow, you know, it's gonna be a beautiful day this weekend. Uh, you know, look at how cool this kid's program is. I would love to support them. Let me take them all out on my boat for the day. Um, and they're like, when they come back and they're like, well, what's the safe sport thing? Do I have to go through this training now? And they view it as almost an extra hurdle to be able to helping out the program. Um, and I, I think one of the big things we've really worked with is uh, instead of mandating, because it's not a sustained contact point, eh, <laughs> for the most part. Um, so what we've kind of changed and shifted in policy is adding uh, the caveat that, you know, our instructors who are safe sport trained need to be there as the authority on the boat. And we need to make sure that there are specific rules in place on uh, accessing the head on where the kids are allowed to go in the boat, um, you know, which parts of the boats are off limits, uh, and kind of really setting those guidelines off right, right off the bat. Um, so that way, not only, you know, the boat owner is aware of where the kids can and can't be, which they usually really appreciate, uh, but the kids are also, you know, right off the bat, they know where it is on the boat that they're supposed to be at all times. Um, and it just kind of helps create that uh, sense of 
okay, cool, we can work together to make this happen and make sure that everybody stays safe. I think that's been the big one is just the occasional volunteer has been concerned about it. I think another challenge that we actually haven't come to an answer yet and talking about that paradigm shift and how unique sailing is, I think one of the lovely things about sailing over the years has been going and uh, sleeping over someone's house or figuring out a part of regatta and making sure the social side also feeds in. And I've, I sit on the JSA board of Long Island Sound and part of that conversation is we're trying to keep the social stuff in sailing and make sure people are having fun. COVID made a lot of us have less fun, but we have not figured out how to balance the, the safe sport mandates as well as uh, offer things like dances again. And I'm sure that will be easier, but the, the housing in particular has been a big challenge that we don't actually have an answer yet for. Yeah. So, and that's a good point you brought up. And I know I, I did not grow up sailing. I've been at US Sailing now for almost two and a half years, and I've learned a lot about uh, the sailing worlds in that time. And I think the coolest thing that I've learned is how in youth sailing, there's the, you know, people stay at each other's houses when they go to regattas. I, I think that's awesome. And, and the Safe Sport uh, program is not uh, intended to, to kill that. I think it's just being aware um, of maybe extra protections that can uh, be placed, you know, when you are organizing housing hosts for regattas or hosting social functions for the kids and the families. Um, safe sport training is certainly a piece of that, um, but it's also, you know, there are other things that your club, you know, maybe can do as well, um, depending on what, what, you know, logistics, what works for your club. But um, by no means uh, should, you know, the housing, um, you know, hosting situation, you know, be changed just because of, you know, the safe sport change. That's the sort of a decision that I think clubs need to make on their own is like what level, um, uh, of risks they want to undertake and how they how they handle um, those regattas. Thank you. Um, and then the last thing before we get to a few questions, maybe if there's time, um, how can U.S. Sailing assist your program if you are interested in either you know creating um, a safe sport program or developing it, you know, to a you know to another level. What, what, what can we do at U.S. Sailing to assist that? Whether it's, you know, with regards to tracking safe sport training or um, other sorts of training sessions, opportunities to educate, you know, club leadership. Is there anything in particular, a couple things? Uh, my ask would make it easier for programs to track uh, anyone in their circle of who's actually certified. I know there are ways to do it, but I'm not very good at it. Uh, and when people sort of fall off from being certified, sometimes we don't, we check in the beginning of the summer and maybe before a big regatta, but I know that part of the, um, the certification process besides being CPR, first aid, uh, heads up and all that is also being safe sport certified. So my ask, I guess, would be an easier way to, to track that and make sure all of the people that I'm responsible for makes it a little easier for them to for me to make sure they are certified. I think the only, yeah, the only thing I would add to that is um, I think one of the key things is, is when people start trying to implement the safe sport frame framework, uh, it can initially seem a little overwhelming. Uh, I think it would be really great to provide either contacts or examples of how other clubs have really started implementing that and what key things they found have really worked. Um, whether that's having, uh, you know, leaders within, you know, different organizations say, yeah, I'd be happy to be like a contact resource of like, this is what we've done. This is what's worked. Um, here's how we've made it. So that way, uh, when I have to call a kid into the office and call their parent because they've done some sort of bedlam, um, you know, this is uh, how we handle that and make sure that we're still following, you know, the open door policy without, you know, airing those grievances to the entire club. So it, it's just a matter of um, finding those solutions that have worked elsewhere and figuring out how best to apply them in your each individual situations. Because of course, every yacht club is set up a little differently and every community club organization, uh, sailing school is similarly, has their own framework and location. All right, well, thanks for your, for your input on that one. Um, I guess at this point, 
don't know how we're doing on time. Maybe time for a question or two. Josh, it's up to you. Yeah, and, and we had a couple too that came in from registration. Before we got to a couple questions we had here, did anyone have any questions out in the crowd? Oh, we do have some. Great. Um, we have our runner. Heather's going to grab a microphone and maybe over to over here first, and then we'll go back over the side. <laughs> She's great. Thank you. I just have, um, being someone who is not tuned into the TikTok uh, generation, um, I was very interested this week um, to be aware of this young girl who found herself in difficulty, who had the hand signal. Um, I think that was great. Um, I certainly learned from that. And uh, I was wondering if the center or if the Safe Sport um, program has anything, or do you encourage that, that hand signal? Or, I mean, how does someone let someone know? I, I was fascinated this week with uh, learning about it, and I'm sure I'm very late to this learning process. It appears I'm a little later than you. Can you explain what you're talking I about? Can, I can help with that one okay. a little bit, actually. Go ahead, Tara. <laughs> I got you guys. It's all good. Uh, so uh, knowing a little bit about that, um, it's less of a hand signal sort of setup uh, and more of there's easy ways to anonymously uh, let someone know that there's problems happening um, beyond just the giant big red button that is now on U.S. Sailing's website. I believe it's still a big red button, right? Yeah. Um, there's uh, several other uh, avenues to do that coaches, um, people in authority, once you've gone through the safe sport, tra safe sport training, uh, you quickly learn who are the mandatory reporters who are able to help out. It's also really easy to print out one of those one-page flyers of who within your organization is someone that you can contact to be like, hey, something's not right. This is a situation that I'm uncomfortable in. I'm being harassed, abused, whatever that might be. Um, but it also provides an easy access point to which as many of us know, right, kids typically have their electronics uh, practically glued to their hands. Um, it, it provides that easy access point of, you know, here's a button, here's what you fill out. You don't even have to put your name on it. Um, but you can let someone know an authority that I'm in a really bad situation, something's going on, and I need assistance. Yeah, I think your question um, sort of gets at just generally making people aware if you are, if you are um, experiencing... Um, some form of misconduct or if you're feeling uncomfortable. And again, I think I, sh I should, should have said this at the beginning. US, our, our website does have a uh, reporting button. I believe it's right at the top of our homepage. Um, and that directs you right to the US Center for Safe Sports reporting uh, intake form. Um, so just want to make everyone aware of that. And as far as having um, unique ways of identifying if you're in a you know, a, a tough situation or an uncomfortable, unsafe situation. I have not seen anything from the center on that, but it's a it's noted. Apparently, it was just holding your hand to this young uh. lady. She held her hand up, took her thumb, and put it into a zip line to close her fingers over it. And it's it was that signal that somebody recognized from TikTok. It's similar to like uh, sometimes you'll go into a bar or something and like in the bathroom will be the, hey, if you're, you know, being harassed while you're sitting at the bar, you know, you can mention this specific drink to a bartender and they'll know to make sure that you get a safe exit out the back of the bar and we'll get you away from, you know, whoever's harassing you or bothering you. Um, there's not something specific to that point from the center as far as I'm aware, but there is uh, easy ways to anonymously let people know and get, you know, the help that is needed. <laughs> Hi, Jane. Tara, I don't know if that, oh. <laughs> Everyone knew that on the back of a bathroom door, there's posters about how to get help at a bar, so just so you all know. Um, money talks, right? So I submitted Safe Sport 
safe sport information to our insurance company and to the municipality that we lease our facility from. They waived certain insurance requirements and discounted, and I saved about $20,000 by submitting the paperwork and all of the safe sport information. Um, and so do it. <laughs> um, it's not just good for you know, the sake of the whole purpose, but the bottom line as well. Um, and so I just wanted to make that note. Um, every single person, you have to guarantee, I guarantee it anyway, everyone's stuff is different. But, um, and then also I encourage you to invite in a social worker or a child advocate into part of your training program um, to help for signs of abuse or anything like that. But I just wanted to mention the money part because money makes people listen. Thanks. That's an excellent point. I'll uh, come talk to you afterwards. I'd like to know more about that. <laughs> Anything else from the crowd out here? We are running about 15 minutes late, but uh, lucky for you all, I thought this ended at 4 o'clock, and I saw on the schedule it says 3.45. So on my time, we are right on sh schedule. <laughs> Anything else? I got one other question that came in. Um, we had a bunch of questions, but we don't have time for them all. One of the things that you guys were talking about, Kevin, was that it would be great to have an easy way to find out who's Safe Sport certified. And... Um, and Justin, one of the questions was, how can I ensure or verify that my staff is safe port trained? Is there an easy way to be able to do that? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, first of all, all US sailing certified instructors are supposed to take safe sport. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case 100% of the time, but we are working on ways to up that. Um, but if you go through the level one, level two, level three coaching course, you're told that you're, you're supposed to take safe sport. Um, so that's one way of of making sure that your sailing staff has taken safe sport. Um, the other way is just reach out to me. Uh, right now there's not an automated way um, for you to, to look it up other than to go on to the is it my US sailing member lookup that usually lists, it lists all certifications, but again, that's sort of a manual process. Um, we're starting to think about ways we can make it more automated as, you know, along with what Kevin had, had, had said. Um, that would be a much better way of doing things. But for now, I think if you have questions about who at your organization has taken Safe Sport, please just reach out to me. Um, I should provide my contact info, but we can um, get that to everyone that was in attendance. Um, and I, you know, I can be the, the point of contact if, if you have further questions about that. Justin Sterk at ussailing.org. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure if you have any questions about anything, Justin's always there in the office ready to answer all of your questions about safe sport or if you like hockey too, he's a very avid hockey player. So he's happy to answer questions only about the Red Wings though. Um, can we get a round of applause for our uh, panelists? Justin Stirk, Tara Foster, and Kevin Broom. <laughs>